Hello, everyone. Um, hello. I see that we have here Diana um, Aiton Shankar, which is the head of Leonardo, Leonardo Laser. Uh, and we're very glad to have you with us <laughs> today. Um, and hello to all the audience, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, ideally, we would have met in Transmit Art and Science Festival in Tel Aviv on October 12th. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the, the war and the massacre in Israel um, and crimes against humanity that happened on the 7th of October had other plans for us. Um, and still, those crimes are happening by Hamas in Gaza, sadly. Uh, so we're sending our love and thoughts to all the people that are wounded and kidnapped and their beloved ones are missing. And we will move on in a modest way. You know, a little bit of the festival without ignoring uh, the situation. We will speak a little bit about the festival and a little bit about stress that is here with us uh, for the past five weeks. I'm Tal Israel. I'm the curator of the Federal Museum of Nanoscience and Art at the Nanotechnology Institute in Bar Ilan University, a platform for collaborations between artists and scientists. Uh, and with me are Sharona Florsheim, um, Roman Volansky and uh, Didi Marshek, which together we are representing the laser rendezvous art and science events in Tel Aviv. And those events are happening around the world in 50. Diana, um, just um, let me know. 57. 57, wow. 57 um, locations around the world. So if you are around the world and wish to see art and science events and participate, uh, you're welcome to look at the laser uh, website. Um, so today we are going to share with you one of the beautiful collaborations that was um, scheduled uh, to premiere on the festival, a collaboration between uh, Professor Lee Koren uh, from the Faculty of Life Science in Barilan University and Professor Shai Cohen from the Music Department in Barilan University. And with them will speak Dr. Tali Vankovsky um, that is now at Barcelona uh, at her postdoc and uh, she will speak about her research as well. So without further ado, uh, we'll start with um, the story of how it happens. The museum is a platform for collaborations between artists and scientists, long time collaborations, uh, collaborations between artists and scientists when they take their time, they usually get deeper and uh, each part of the collaboration gets new ideas. We also have some published research that happened before. And uh, I think that uh, the first conversation between Lee and Shai uh, had lots of promise. And um, I will let each one of the participants uh, introduce themselves, um, and then we will speak a little about each research. So, Lee, shall we start with you? Should we start with a presentation or just? With, with uh, a little bit introduction about yourself. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Lee, and I'm a zoologist. Um, I'm actually a behavioral ecologist, and I study um, wildlife behavior. I'm especially interested how wildlife feel and behave in their natural surroundings and what motivates them and the decisions they make um, to, to behave in certain manners. Um, I also study um, hormones and social behavior. Um, so we look at the motivation and what actually 
uh, facilitates the behaviors through steroid hormones specifically. Um, so we're really interested in the differences between males and females and how they behave and how they communicate with each other. Beautiful. Um, and Shai, can you tell us a little bit about your research, about yourself? Um, you're muted, Shai. My name is Shai Cohen, and I'm a professor of composition and technologies in the Department of Music at Bar Ilan University. Uh, I was asked to perform a concert uh, by Tal uh, based on the acoustic signal of the rock uh, Harxes. And sadly, due to, due to the situation in Israel, uh, the concert uh, did not take place. Uh, therefore, I will share with you uh, only the thoughts and the ideas that were in the back, background of my work later on. So you can see uh, how things were uh, planned to be. Going to Tal. Hi, the other Tal in <laughs> this conversation. Hi, I'm the other Tal. I'm a psychologist, and my research focuses on creative behavior uh, from cross cultural differences to the link between curiosity and creativity, which I will briefly speak about today. And more recently, I'm running a project about uh, the relationship between creativity, predictive processing, and mental health. So just before we start for our international audience, um, we are experiencing some um, emergencies here. So if we will hear a siren, some of us will run to the shelter and you will not see us here. Uh, we will probably come back after a few minutes. Um, so uh, Tal, the only one that is in Barcelona, will, will take the lead uh, while we are sheltering. And um, let's speak about uh, Rock Hyrex. Okay. <laughs> So we're starting a collaboration because my presentation is not working. So Shai. Okay. Thank you, Shai. Okay. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about what Rock Hyrax's songs tell us and what started this co collaboration. So Shai, let's see the Hyrax's. Um, so rock hyraxes are ancient African mammals that I've been studying for 25 years now. They're highly social and they live in groups that consist of both sexes. They're females and their pups, about one or two resident males and late dispersing males. And usually females are dominant in the group. As you could see, there's limited sexual dimorphism. So it's hard to tell who's a male and who's a female. We actually have to capture them to see who they are. Um, in the groups, the males are the ones that disperse and the females usually stay in their natal groups, but they could move as well or break from the main group into little groups. Males can either be residents, that means that they live with females in a group, or bachelors, which means that they live alone or with other males. And resident, residency is not related to age and, and the tenure is about three, three years and up to five years. We think that females choose the resident males based on their singing abilities. So singing is really important. Okay, next slide, please, Shai. Thanks. Um, their songs are really unique. There are no two songs alike, um, but individuals have distinct voices. And just like you could recognize your friends just listening to their voices, um, sorry, um, hyraxes could recognize each other. Their songs sound like this. Play it, Shai. So as you, I don't know if you've heard anything like it before in your life, but I often see visitors in the Angeti Research Reserve where we study them trying to figure out whether it's birds or what 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 is making these sounds, which I think are really cool. 
Um, okay, next slide. <laughs> so we work, as I mentioned, within the Engedi Nature Reserve, and it's right by the Dead Sea. That's the sea that you see um, far off. Um, Engedi is a really healthy nature reserve. It has natural vegetation. It's got predators. Um, I used to see leopards, which are already extinct, but now we have hyenas and wolves um, and foxes and many birds of prey. Um, and there's very extreme weather there during the summers. Almost all of the Hyrex population in our study areas are marked. Um, next slide, please. And we could study them through marking them with collars. As you can see here, there's a male with a collar and it's got W6 on it, that's its name. And we also put earrings on the younger ones where we don't put collars on the babies. And that way we could recognize all the individuals and also collect information about their age, their sex, their size, their hormones, their DNA, their genetics, and so on. Next slide. We could also observe their behavior because we marked them. And here I am in 2000, that's 23 years ago, in Arugot, which is part of the reserve. And I'm observing a group of hyaxes through a telescope. Um, and we observe their behavior, their social behavior, from which we could calculate their social status and who see who's dominant and who's a leader. We also observe who's friends with whom, who mates with whom and try to make sense of it all, try to figure out how they behave the way they do and generalize it to game strategies and life in general. Okay, next slide. So I recorded singing over five years for my PhD and ever since we've been recording their songs and found out that mostly it's the males that sing. I've heard a few females sing, but all males sing and the males that sing a lot are the males that are older, they're larger, they're more dominant. And they also have higher testosterone levels and testosterone is usually related to aggression, yeah. dominance, and also higher cortisol levels. And that's related to stress. And Tal will talk about that in a bit later on. Okay, next slide. Um, we don't really know why they sing. Um, we know that singing increases towards the mating period. Um, they only mate for a couple of days a year, and we never we they don't tell us when those days are. So we observe them and wait for those days. But after they mate, they stop singing. Um, so we think it has to do with mate choice, although we don't really see any reaction from females to male songs. Um, the males choose all kinds of stages to sing on, um, and some of them seem strange. For example, if a pep is in danger, like here you see when we capture it. Then the males start singing. Um, so we think it's because if the, the pups are screaming, then everybody's listening and seeing who the predator is. And that's a really good stage to start singing. And if one starts singing, then sometimes others start answering him and singing or joining him and so on. Next slide. Um, so just a few words about what they sing. So a lot of it could be inferred through social context. Um, for example, in most species, including humans, if the context, um, the context really has to do with how the song sounds, so the type of vocalizations. For example, if we're talking about appeasement, then usually it's really pleasant to the ear and sing songy, uh, while aggression is really rough and low. If, even if you don't know the animal, if you hear a dog like roaring at you and it's rough, and it's low sound, you know that it's aggressive and you should watch out. So that's something that we found as well. And next slide. And just last thing I want to say is that um, there are three generally elements in hyrax songs. Um, whales, which are usually related to the hyrax identity. They, they come at the beginning of the song. Then there's chucks. They're really, really short. And they're related to cortisol levels, maybe stress as well. And snorts, which are rough and seem to be really important to show the age and social status, which are not related. And just because we're going to be talking about stress today, um, Shai, can you play that little tune um, at the bottom? That has to do with, um, oh, no, you went backwards. Um, if you go forward. Back, no. Backwards or forward? No, forward, um, where we had... <laughs> 
No, I did that. Okay, and the aggression. Okay, next. Lower. And then the next one. Okay, so these are the whales, um, the chucks and the snorts. And there's a little um there's a little um sound file here as well. Can you see it? Shy at the bottom. Yeah. These are the chucks, and that's the snorts. The very shorts are the chucks and the the snorts are the snores. Um and that's it. The last slide is just a beautiful picture from Engedi that has a rainbow that signifies hopefully peace and a better future. And uh, and that's just my little intro about Hyrex vocalizations. Um, and I can hear more and more about every time I get to Lee's lab, there's something new, a new story, a new finding. Um, so if we speak about rock hyrax and how they are similar to human beings in, in some thoughts. Um, maybe Tal will speak a little bit about your research related to stress or other uh, state of minds. Can everyone see my screen? We see yeah. your presenter's notes as well, though, Tal. Oh, sorry for that. Let's try again. Maybe go to display setting. Yeah. Now we now we see. Yeah. Now you can see. Her. Okay, great. So as Tal mentioned, I'm going to speak about something a bit different and to try and explain how stress might affect uh, creative behavior in human beings. So I'm sure that most of you are familiar with our bodily response to stress, but our response to stressful environment is also dependent on our mental state, or in other words, our state of mind. So when, when we are stressed, our thinking is narrowed. And the only thing that we can think about is actually what made out, us stressed out. So it's, it's called ruminative thinking or ruminations, and it's like a vicious circle of thoughts, and you are stuck in the middle. Creativity, on the other hand, depends on broad thinking, which is our ability to connect seemingly remote associations with one another in order to create something new. So for example, uh, what is the first association that comes to mind when you hear the word mother? I guess that the, for most of you, it would be either child or father, but if I will ask you to think more broadly, you probably come out with something completely different, such as nature or goose. So the associative network of creative people is much more broad and condensed, so they can easily jump from one association to another and go farther up in their associative network. Our state of mind, or more specifically, our openness to experience, also affect how we approach uncertain environment. So similarly to the broad and narrow thinking, here the continuum ranges from exploration at one end, in which people attend to the environment with a wider scope, they are more learning oriented, and they are tuned more to novel information, and to exploitation in the, on the other end, in which people rely more on existed knowledge and on their expectation, they are less open to surprises and then gravitate on detail rather than on the big picture. So the more exploratory I am, the more I will encounter uncertain situation as surprising and exciting. And the more exploitatory I, will, I, I am, 
I will experience the exact same situation as anxiety inducing and thus I will rather stick with the familiar and the known. So of course it's not this or the other and normally we dynamically shift between these two states. So there are moments that we are more exploratory and we want to learn something new or try new experiences. And there are moments that we are more exploitatory and we just want to watch our favorite movie again and again. Oh, sorry. Um, so back to creativity, it is deeply connected to the way uh, we tolerate uncertainty and approach novel information. It's increasingly acknowledged that creativity um, involves two phases. First, the idea generation phase, in which we can think about as many ideas as we can. This is the free associations stage where we combine those remote association together. And it is followed by an idea evaluation phase when we logically assess each of the ideas that we came up with in, in the previous stage. So only after the screening of the evaluation phase, the idea actually comes to light. So throughout the creative process, we actually move from more, more exploratory state of mind, which is necessary in order to generate um, creative ideas to a more exploitatory state of mind which is necessary for refining and elaborating those ideas. Um, sorry for that, I jumped again. Um, an optimal state of mind for creativity to thrive would be our ability to flexibly balancing or shifting between these two uh, state of mind. We recently expanded uh, this model and suggested that uh, every novelty seeking behavior such as creativity or curiosity, for example, start with an affinity to the novel and ends with commitment to the novel stimulation we just discovered. So in curiosity, we commit to the novel information and a new association is created in our memory and in creativity, we commit to the novel idea or this novel combination of remote association and a new node is created in our associative thinking. So the process, process results in broadening of our uh, associative network and the scope of our thinking. The more association the nodes in our network, the broader our scope of thinking will be. Um, just a quick note, the affinity itself also um, affected by uh, our state of mind. So we can think of affinity as a torch or a spotlight uh, that light our scope of interest. It can be rather specific if we're in an exploitatory state of mind, or it can be broad if we're in an exploratory state of mind. In other words, our state of mind influences the way our creativity or curiosity would take. So exploration results in diversity. So we will have a general interest and we will think about as many ideas as we can. But if we are in an exploratory state of mind, we, we will feel more of specific interest to a problem that bugs us which drive us to reduce this feeling of uncertainty by acquiring the missing information or finding a, a, a solution, sorry, to the specific problem that, uh, that we deal with. Um, so to wrap up, situational demands determine our state of mind that in turn shapes our creative behavior. Back to stress, and based on our model, mind stress might encourage exploration and benefit creativity, such as upcoming deadline, for example, while stressful and my environment might lead to narrow thinking, inflexibility, and cognitive load, which in turn hinder creativity. So to conclude, it, it is reasonable to assume that there is an inverted U-shaped 
relationship between stress and creativity, in which while our ability to tolerate uncertainty might incur creativity, too much of it or too much stress might lead to a standstill exploitative state of mind, which will leave no room for new ideas to come. So I would like to thank you. And next time that you are stressed out, try to think about Mother Goose and untangle your thoughts. <laughs> thank you. Beautiful. So do you think that your um, rock hierarchies are creative? Uh, you're asking? Yeah. A very anthropomizing question and yeah. although we now now it's allowed to talk about animal feelings when I was a student we were not allowed to even think that animals might have feelings and now we recognize that so with it many other um, things might come including creativity but it's it's very hard I mean we're trying to understand why there are um, communicating in a certain way and we know that no two songs are alike but we don't know if it's providing information that's very specific to the context or whether they are actually being creative and trying to prepare something new but I cannot um, speculate on that hmm. I will see uh, <laughs> and just, just to imagine the, the situation that um, we will experience, we will have the festival, hopefully soon, but uh, the experience was, uh, shy thought was to, to create an environment of almost filling in the field with speakers on several parts of uh, the room, and just imagining thinking. So in this kind of um, imagination, in this kind of vision, we will uh, go to, uh, we'll hear Shai. And, thank, thank you, and Tal. Us. So as you said, uh, my task was to explore the voices in a musical improvisation, a very difficult task. So I, uh, I was uh, thinking about it uh, and about uh, the challenges. Uh, and as you can see, the acoustic signals of the rock houses are used for communication. My question was, is it possible to create interesting music out of it? A 40 minutes uh, concert, improvised concert. And what is the best uh, way to maintain the interest uh, over time? and uh, what technologies uh, should be used and how. Uh, and then uh, I needed to choose a plan because I can, I, I can, I can do every, everything. My plan was uh, layering sound, sounds derived from the raw materials to take the, 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 the sounds that uh, Lee gave me and, and try to, to, to start from that point. Then uh, to make a spectral decomposition of the acoustic phenomenon and create kind of a roadmap for improvisation that uh, I can uh, interactively uh, play with uh, my flute. And also, uh, mm -hmm. I've tried uh, to yeah, control yes, to the, the sounds, the different sounds mm -hmm. with the yes, controllers that I, I will show you later by a, a kind of a ring that I'm wearing on my hand while playing the flute. And lastly, uh, just for my fun in, in the concert to add some uh, code based, improv uh, uh, based improvisation and algorithmic program while playing so the audience will see how things are uh, evolving through the concert. So the choice of technologies tools was uh, mainly based on uh, uh, environment called Ableton Live. It's a digital audio workstation that allows me to add, to put in uh, components that I can program in an other environment called Max MSP in the connection uh, of Max for Life. And the live coding I planned to do in another environment, a super collider environment, 
the ring uh, is a wireless ring. It's a Bluetooth ring. So it's uh, sending the, da the data from my hand to the internet uh, into the, that program and microphone, sound card, and my flute. This is my setup uh, that I need it in order to uh, perform. Now, because I cannot play you the concert, uh, I uh, will demonstrate the various extension uh, of my talk uh, by uh, uh, showing, showing you a video files, uh, screen captures that I did on each part of the layers, and then you can uh, understand the, the whole thing. So I will start with the main environment, the Ableton environment, and talk, uh, and you can see the, some experience I, I, I did with it. So first I'll play the raw material. As you can see in here, it has a lot of uh, background noise in it. So one way to deal with this was uh, to use uh, noise gate techniques and then to identify uh, the significant event using an algorithm that detect the onsets. Now, uh, each uh, sound trigger other sounds in an electric piano. So I have kind of uh, melodies that comes out of the uh, singing. You can follow the events by looking at the original waveform. And now I may play I will play you another time. So you can see the difference between the files. So the next step would be to add some uh, effects on it that samples the sound and project it into space. Okay, so you can think about it as one layer that uh, I can play my flute uh, against it. And uh, now I will present to you uh, how the sounds can be decomposed spectral spectrally and map into two-dimension space in order to play with them by creating kind of a grand map for improvisation. So the same file, opening the same file, and break it down into parts in order to create a corpus that can be analyzed with lines. Each of the points uh, visible on the display can be activated by moving the mouse across the screen or using the external controller. This is the noise. If I'm adding an effect to it, it becomes uh, more like a environment sound. Okay, this, this is the second method. Uh, now, in order to expand the sound and make it uh, uh, more interesting musically, 
I, I've add, added more effects and make it bigger. So in this demonstration, you can see that it's almost the same, but with much more effects. Um, now I'm adding the effect. If you had, you have an a, a, a headphones, you can uh, listen in stereo. This is a, a way to add a continuous evaluation of the timber and, and holding the, the notes in time. So it becomes a kind of a cloud of sounds. Another file. the noise only the noise Okay, this is a short uh, demonstration of how can so little sound can grow into a mess of sound. And uh, with the live coding, the idea in live coding is uh, to on-fly programming uh, and let the audience see uh, how things are developed while uh, programming. Because I uh, have a short time here, I'm, I've put uh, some uh, earlier program and you can uh, watch how I'm activating the code, uh, but the idea is to write the code uh, in front of the audience and, pro and project it. So I'm creating the synthesizer, creating the environment for the composition, and then I can play uh, some loop of the sounds, like the, the first code. It produces a rhythmic pattern. And I can release it and fade in another code. The second code is more uh, random and, and short sounds like uh, grains.
So you can imagine at that point uh, how the layers work. So if I had the Ableton layer and, and the live coding layer, everything is on top of uh, the other. So, and now uh, I'll show you how I'm uh, in, uh, interactively uh, playing my flute and uh, make a spectral connection or spectral match between the flute playing and the sound map. The same file in the input, analyze it, uh, creating a map and then uh, extracting several audio descriptions for my playing. And so searching the correlation. Okay, this is very short uh, demonstration. And uh, the last one, the, I also uh, opened the camera so you can see me playing my, the flute and, uh, and see the wave ring, uh, the wireless MIDI controller uh, and how it works. Uh, so I'm playing, uh, the computer capture my uh, playing and I can move my hands and you will see it in the screen capture. So this is the ring. It has a six function that can be used uh, individually uh, or mixed together. And I can change the sound with my hand. Okay, so the idea in the concert is to make a wave of sounds. Sometimes my flute is uh, over the other sounds and sometimes the other sounds are taking place. Uh, so in conclusion, it is uh, very difficult to convey the content of improvisation concert in a Zoom, but I hope uh, you get the general idea uh, of the various techniques. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's, it's difficult to imagine a space <laughs> via flat screen. Um, but this much into looking into the raw materials that um, I'm interested in and interested also to, to ask Lee when, when you, those sounds that you worked on already are going through the system that Shai usually using can you imagine new approaches to what you hear usually? Um, do you have a question? It's, it's just the beginning of the uh, collaboration between them. Um, so we're still with lots of questions and, and lots of potential. Yeah, I, I think that it, the collaboration is really excited because we're really talking about creativity. We're very limited in what kind of questions we could ask and how we could interpret the vocalizations by our limits of detection. And Shai is really introducing other dimensions that I haven't thought of and his approach is very different. And I think the, the tools, the analytical tools and also the way of thinking can interact with our research and provide other dimensions that we haven't considered. I mean, that's 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 my that that's what I've enjoyed so far, and and also just listening to what you've created now, Shai was was really fun for me. I mean, I started I, I wasn't supposed to study hyrax vocalization. I was supposed to study something else, but I kept on hearing them, and it made me laugh, and it, I really enjoyed it. And I found myself laughing now listening to you, just like really enjoying the whole other dimensions and I mean this was very very different from the naturalistic um, sounds but it interacted in in a really interesting way that I think could help us 
look at it and learn maybe more about what the animals are producing through what you're introducing? Yes, first of all, uh, the, 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 to, the fun is the word because uh, when I come to a situation of playing, it should be fun. It should, it sh I should enjoy what I'm doing and also to create a kind of meditating uh, environment in the kind of quasi dark uh, place uh, that you, can, you cannot uh, feel it now in the Zoom, but hopefully in the concert, uh, if we will make it, uh, it would uh, be very different. And um, uh, when when you hear uh, people that are collaborating, coming from different creativities, um, what can you offer them from the research about collaboration of of two different disciplines? I think that it's kind of a live example for combining two remote research fields and creating something new. So for me, it was really nice to sit and see my theory <laughs> comes to life. And yeah, I was also wondering, and I wanted to ask Shai, whether the creative process or the composing process was different um, with those unique set of stimuli that you were given. Yes, of course, it was different. Uh, first of all, it's an uh, improvisation, improvised approach, and not a written uh, composition. Uh, if I I would wanted to make a composition out of it, I I would take the sounds and put them in time and do the, all the uh, work of a composer. But the idea here was, uh, as uh, Lee mentioned, to 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 create something interactively with a lot of fun with playing the flute and make everything. So what the outcome of it is uh, depend on, on the strategy, the long strategy of what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing. But uh, so the idea of, of layers can, can give me air. So I can do something and it holds in the speakers and, and I can take another instrument or write a code or do something else and everything always hold in space so there's no quiet other if i want to make a quiet but if i don't want a, the sound is always there so this this is a was my, my approach of course in composition it's different because the time is, is different the, the 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 energy that uh, i want to produce in time is different from a concert that's it when when you received all the the files um what i said that was uh, email to you was uh, lots of files with different singing, different hierarchs, rightly. Um, wh when you slowly, slowly start to, to open the layers, separate them, uh, what do you find on this? You find, do you have like a moment of a wow, those are repetitions or things that you were very happy to find? This is a very, very good questions because it's very difficult. It's not in the domain of music. It's not a melody. It's not pure tone. Uh, and it's, it's a, a very challenge, was very challenging to me. But uh, I, I, when I made my plan, I saw that if I'm putting in a different file, uh, the energy is, uh, take, it, it's take me to another place. So uh, I was thinking a lot of what kind of, what files fits my environment and what files are not, uh, does not fit or make, make something else because they, they have timing, they have energy in, in, in their time and the, the noises that I have to deal with also uh, that I put it in uh, to create, to expand the energy. If, if there was an, if the input was different, of course the composition was different. Mm -hmm. And you you mainly work with solo singing. Yes. Yes. Okay, it will be very interesting to to hear dialogues, mm -hmm. how how they work, and those layers in space. Yeah. Um, and I think we we can open it to to the audience to your questions. So if someone have I didn't look at the chat yet, but you're very welcome. 
to ask questions. And, and meanwhile, I want to tell you um, a little bit about the festival and a little bit about laser art and science around the rules. Um, maybe perhaps Diana, would, would you like to tell us about this initiative? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for uh, the opportunity to come together with art science technology so beautifully and powerfully through this platform and at this time when we so desperately need a sense of belonging to a larger community and the power of hope and creativity to counter the fear and anguish we're feeling in, in uh, uh, all of our, of our ways that we connect to this time. Uh, so I'm Diana Aitenschenker from Leonardo ISAST, and one of the things that we do in our international organization of art science technology is uh, uh, serve this network of lasers, our Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous, hosted in now nearly 57 places around the world, including this wonderful group. Uh, uh, and I was struck by Tal Ivankovsky's comment that Lee and Shai's collaboration was a beautiful manifestation affirming uh, your research, Tal, which was so interesting for me that I'm looking forward to learning more about, but also uh, very much an affirmation of Leonardo and our vision that uh, we believe the interdisciplinary uh, cre creativity and collaboration will open up new insights and inroads to uh, create the world we want to see and we want to be. The particular collaboration with Lee Koren and Shai Kohn's work, to me, was not just that it was interdisciplinary innovation, um, but it was interspecies improvisation. And there was, you know, there were there were multiple species coming in there, made me curious about how this approach would work with other species as well, bringing not only that movement from solo voice to dialogue, but but different groups coming in together, and what we can learn from and model from different groups coming together to make music, and make wonder and make us wonder in a way that is playful and joyful and fun. So uh, to me, this was a, a beautiful manifestation of a laser that uh, is just what we need in the world today and in this region in particular and uh, through Leonardo. Thank you so much. You. It's wonderful and uh, we are so glad to be part of the laser art and science from the rooms and hopefully next time we will meet live if possible <laughs> um and we would like to also share with you a little bit about our beautiful festival um in sharona floor sign is here um and she's a geographer and part of our team both of the lasers and the transmit festival in can you tell us a little bit please hi hi everyone hi diana so nice to see you with us um yes uh, we have this strange karma around the, the festival the first one the first edition was cancelled due to the corona and now we have this second edition and we had to postpone that as well because of the um, the horrible events of the 7th uh, of October. So the festival was actually planned the same week uh, following the Saturday. Um, so it was very clear to us that um, we won't be able to to have this gathering the way we planned and uh, everybody was mourning and and just realizing what has happened. And so instantly we decided to to actually um, cancel the festival when it was due to happen and delay it uh, 
for now yet uh, to unknown uh, dates. So we are hoping that it will, of course, everything will settle down and we will be able to go to, back to normal life. But uh, we are yet uh, uncertain when this will happen. Uh, just so just a few words about the plan and uh, that was supposed to happen. It was supposed to be a three days festival. Uh, first, uh, on a Thursday, open to the general public, uh, a full event in the uh, Steinhardt uh, Natural Museum uh, um, 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 galleries. Um, four premieres, the Chai and Li are one of them. Other premieres were to do with the combination of dance and uh, neuroscience, um, music and, uh, and kidney diseases. Uh, and the last one, um, um, optics and music. So these were the four premieres that were supposed to take place uh, alongside with lectures. Uh, the whole evening about education as a bridge, cross-disciplinary education, um, neuroscience and art, and uh, uncertainty. That was the third session, which was um, constructed around the, the sense of uh, uncertainty um, and how we um, act and respond to that situation mathematically, uh, psychologically, um, and more. And the second day was Friday that was supposed to run like a conference for artists and scientists. We had two international speakers, Victoria Vesna from uh, Artsai in uh, California, in Los Angeles, and Daniel Glazer, which was the founder of um, um, Science Gallery in London. Both of them are key um, figures in the international scene of art and science. Um, after that, followed um, by um, a, a short uh, um, a concert uh, by Shai, which you were, which you heard now, like the the, the basic or the ideas and and practice, and then a meetup for um, um, artists and scientists who are actually interested in collaborating and creating uh, cross disciplinary collaborations. And so that was Friday and Saturday was for kids and and uh, and families. So we brought together uh, scientists, uh, physics, uh, talking about gravity and a performance, um, dance performance uh, relating to elasticity and gravity. And another uh, performance for children and the whole family, um, a puppet theater uh, that we joined with um, 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 ecology, ec um, ecology. Ecolog yeah, oh. ecology and and um, and like um, climate change uh, in the world. So these were like two activities for the for a wider uh, children and family uh, audience. So that was the plan, and I really hope we can make it happen soon. For the best uh, of everyone, I mean, so not only for the festival, but the fact that we can actually go back to, to normal life. Yes, we cross our fingers. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Arona. And uh, if we have questions, we'll turn to the questions. And if not, we'll continue our day. So. I see there's no questions. Um, so I, I wish to thank you all very much for turning in and uh, keep safe and creative. Ah, we, we do have a question. Um, Rotom, you can just un unmute. Hi, yeah. So I wanted to ask, um, something a little bit a little bit more basic about um, the lectures. I wanted to ask what was the process behind choosing to call the um, their con communication songs rather than speaking or something like that. What was the process behind it? 
Yeah, actually, Shai challenged me on that as well. Um, and and it could be a bit provocative using the terminology song. Um, I used it initially because it, it felt like song. It sounded to me like song. And then I realized that in many different um, different disciplines, songs have different di definitions. Um, and in, for some disciplines, it it has it does um, answer the requirements, and maybe in other disciplines, um, in musicology, for example, maybe it doesn't. I'm not sure if we could tick off all the boxes whether it could be. Um, I guess in my mind, um, coming from the animal behavior um, um, area, then it was sort of equivalent to bird song in my mind. I mean, bird songs, depending on the species, some bird, birds have very stereotypical songs and they all sing the same the same tune and repeat it and just repeat the same tune. And then there are other species of birds that could um, um, be very creative or, you know, sort of um, expand on their vocabulary or on their repertoire. So, for me, it was just, it felt like an extension of that. And if birds are allowed to sing, then I think hyraxes are allowed to sing too. Um, and there's no doubt that birds could sing, right? So so why not hyrax? And um, it's interesting to hear what Shai has to say about it. Th that was my question, uh, like uh, Walton uh, said, because it was... Uh, when you hear the 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 sounds, the sound itself, it does not remind you uh, what you you imagine about songs. But uh, Lee Anson's was was amazing. Uh, what birds sings? Why not? Mm -hmm. And if there's no other questions, last one, last chance. <laughs> we'll say goodbye and. Um, We'll pray to meet next time in Transmit Festival. <laughs> Thank you and be safe. Goodbye. You, Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Chal, for organizing. Thank you. All Thank for you, Chal, and Shavona.